ethnically, the Rwandan woman Imakole Iribagiza is a member of the Tutsi tribe. She grew up in Rwanda in a devout Catholic family with several brothers. In April 1994, all hell broke loose in Rwanda during a civil war, and the Hutu tribe, who were the majority of citizens, waged a genocidal war against the Tutsis. The great majority of people in Rwanda on both sides were Catholic, but that didn't stop the slaughter over a period of three or four months, which left, by some estimates, more than one million Tutsis and some moderate Hutus dead. A missionary told the world press at the time, I think there are no devils left in hell. They've all come to Rwanda. When the genocide began, Immaculate, along with seven other women, took refuge in the house of a local Protestant pastor who was a member of the Hutu tribe. The eight women survived by being hidden in a tiny bathroom, bathroom where there was not enough room to even stand. The pastor gave them whatever food he could and outside they could hear former childhood friends and neighbours calling Immaculate's name, for they were Hutus and suspected that she was hiding somewhere in the area. During this time, the women prayed much, and Immaculate clung to her rosary beads day and night because she knew at any minute the mob could discover them and come with their machetes and dispatch brutally and bloodily all of them from this world. Over and over she prayed many rosaries and divine mercy chaplets each day. The more anger and bitterness built up in her soul, the more ardently she would pray. The Hutus had taken everything from her, but she was determined they would not poison her soul. She found it particularly difficult to say the words of the Our Father, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Ninety-one days later, the seriously malnourished and exhausted woman left that bathroom as the fighting had stopped and, to their horror, the world they had grown up on in was changed forever. Most of their family and friends were dead, butchered by other friends and neighbours, all because they belonged to the Tutsi tribe. Immaculate's entire extended family, save one brother who had been abroad when the fighting began, had all been killed. In the months after her ordeal, she continued to struggle with feelings of hatred for those who had done such evil to her and to so many of her tribe. But she turned to God and always begged that he would not allow that bitterness to take root in her soul. At one stage, she visited a prison near her home village to meet the leader of the gang who had killed her mother and one of her brothers. His name was Felician. Before the genocide, he had been a successful and well-respected businessman in the area. As a child, Immaculate used to play with his children. It was Felician's voice that she had heard often calling her name when the killers searched the minister's home, but miraculously did not find them. Now here he was, weeping, half-starved and reduced to nothing. Ashamed for what he had done, he could not look immaculate in the eye. She began to weep when she saw how this once proud and successful man was reduced by the evil he had carried out absolute helplessness and was now destined to live out his life in torment and regret. She then reached out and touched his hands and said, 
I forgive you. The Tutsi prison officer standing with her was furious at what she had said, hoping instead that she would humiliate this man and at least spit on him in contempt. Why did you forgive him? he demanded. Forgiveness is all I have to offer, responded Immaculate. Immaculate is a woman of great faith and she didn't pick and choose the sayings and teachings of Jesus that she, she found most convenient. When Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, he meant it. And that young Rwandan woman took his words seriously and with great love, a love that is only possible with God's grace, she was able to forgive when most others would have found forgiveness impossible. So what about you and me? I don't think too many listening to me have had their entire family butchered. But we probably have found ourselves at some stage the victims of someone's malice or evil intention. Do we carry that wound with us in such a way that it is festering, or seething with rage, bitterness, and an unwillingness to forgive? I'm sure we know people like that. Maybe we were or are that person, consumed with anger at an injustice that was done to us in the past. From Jesus' point of view, we would be slaves of a person's evil if we held on to it in that way. There's one thing to be filled with annoyance, anger, having a grudge, but to harbour that grudge, to feed it, to cultivate it, that's a very dangerous place to be. Forgiveness is hard going. That's why we need to call on Jesus to empower us to follow his example of mercy. Forgiveness often takes time, but the first step is to be willing to forgive and then to ask God to help us. The person who wants to forgive, the person who wants to be free of the bitterness that can poison and paralyze us spiritually, that person will get there eventually if they ask God to give them the grace to be merciful. But there are people who do not wish to forgive. They have allowed the bitterness of the experience of being wronged to eat away at them. Hatred and resentment for their enemies consumes them. They do not wish to forgive and so they are trapped in the wound that was originally inf inflicted on them. That sort of person often says they want justice, but perhaps what they really want is revenge. They will give the excuse that they can't forgive, but what they might really mean in their heart of hearts is that they won't forgive. All of us have been wronged at some stage, I think. Some of us in big ways. All of us, in at least small ways, have received the wrongdoing of another person. If you want to forgive, then by the grace of God you will, but only if you want to. With the person who is not yet able to forgive, God can do great things, but he can do very little with the person who is not willing to forgive, for that kind of person has set their will against it, and God always respects our free will. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Jesus' words and an immense challenge to us all.